Hello everyone, I am Ivana. I am a homeschooling mom. I was a homeschooling mom and now I'm the founder of uh, an online academy which is coming out, um, which is called Cambridge Creation Lab. Um, however, when I'm in front of my very esteemed guests this morning, I feel like um, almost like a dot in Yayo Kusuma's paintings to show uh, an illustration, I'll show you, this is how I feel. One of these dots, you know, which likes to think about infinity. So in your presence, Professor Bueller, I do feel like a dot. And uh, so a little bit about him. Uh, he received his PhD in material science from the Planck Institute for Material uh, Metals Research at the University of Stuttgart. He also has a master's in engineering mechanics from Michigan Tech and earlier had studied at the University of Stuttgart where he's from. Marcus J. Bueller is the McAfee Professor of Engineering and head of the MIT Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He directs the lab for atomistic and molecular mechanics, leads the MIT Germany program and is principal investigator on numerous national and international research programs. His research and teaching activities center on the application of a computational material science approach to understand functional materials properties in biological and synthetic materials, specifically focused on mechanical properties. His work incorporates material science, engineering, mathematics, and the establishment of links between natural materials with the arts through the use of category theory. If I had the time, I could go on for at least 30 minutes or more to partially enlist, partially enlist, not fully, enlist his awards and achievements. But knowing him, he would possibly want me to just talk to him about the interwovenness of sounds and mathematics and material science. And you can just Google on him and you will find a wealth of information. So before I fumble and deviate to something uh, else <laughs> um, about literature or visual arts, which I'm more comfortable talking about, I'm just very curious in exploring the traces and potential potentialities of disciplines that he works with. Um, I must mention that I met Professor Bueller in 2014 rather serendipitously. I wouldn't have known the very basics of the sonic or visual correspondences between science, art, life, or philosophy had I not met him. I wouldn't have known about the magical superimpositions of the possible and the impossible and how transformation follows. Thank you for joining me, Professor Bueller, in this quest to know more about your musical compositions through sonification and how you have been making spider silks, proteins, and viruses sing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivana, for having me and great to meet you again. Thank you. Thank you. So I just get right into the questions. I know you have a busy day ahead. I saw your tweets, you know, you have a really busy day ahead. So I'll get with the first question. Um, you spoke with the International Science Council, and when they asked you, what can sound teach us about finding solutions to the global challenges facing humanity? He told them that sound is an elegant way to access the information stored in a protein and described music as an algorithmic reflection of structure. And furthermore, getting into the core of your material music, as you call it, you said, we can also create awareness to the opposing poles of beauty, life, and death, and understand the concept of deceit as it is at the core of the nature of the virus's pattern of infection and spreading. As we all know, these pandemic days are quite terrifying, exhausting. We are either escaping from the virus or our own insecurities and vulnerabilities. We're getting close to understanding the very sense of life, death, and beauty, but to truly comprehend deceit at the very core, 
of the virus's pattern of infection and spreading is very profound and very visionary and very poetic. Russian playwright and my very favorite, Anton Chekhov, who most likely died of TB, shared his thoughts on death and deceit in a similar fashion. Before getting killed in a duel, his central character in The Three Sisters uses on the meaning of death. He says, what trifling things these idiotic, I'm sorry, what trifling things, what idiotic little details sometimes acquire quite suddenly a significance in one's life for no reason whatsoever. He says, look, there's a tree which has withered, but it still sways in the wind like the other trees. So I think if I should die, I shall still be a part of life like that or in some other way. Listening to your protein resonances pieces, wherein the cello notes flow from mountains to lakes, to wherever the imagination can take you, I hear the Chekhovian hope in the midst of death and infection. Please share with us your unique compositional methods and motivations. How you create this picture of paradise which we experience when we hear these beautiful pieces. Yeah, <clears throat> so, um... You know, one of, at the basis really to a lot of the work we do on, on sound and music and compositions, um, I, I, I look at the similarities between the, the construction of different systems and different manifestations. I mean, you mentioned in the introduction how my work really transcends different disciplines and, 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 and you know, manifestations. And that's something that I, I find to be the case, especially linking um, the construction of materials um, as a material scientist. Um, from the atoms to groups of atoms to molecules to um, microstructures to mesostructures to uh, the form and shapes we can see with our eyes um, to even bigger things that, that we can observe in, in nature or as human engineered materials. That kind of construction principle is very similar to what we see in the creation of musical composition or we can imagine uh, the build-up really beginning from a similar way. Um, the atom isn't the atom, the atom is a sine wave and the, uh, the sine wave can be altered to create the sound of different instruments which can play different notes. Uh, notes can be played against each other or in chords. Um, we can have multiple melodies competing, multiple instruments. And you can actually think about the buildup of, of, of a system, like a musical composition, in a very similar way as the creation of a material. And as it changes over time, um, so does the music. And so that really um, that creational concept is the basis for a lot of the, the things I do. Um, we're also really interested in, in thinking about uh, resonances in the, in, in the nano world and, and, and utilizing not only macroscopic objects like strings um, or membranes um, to create sounds, but actually utilizing the, the quantum mechanical nanoscopic physics of vibrations um, as a way of creating sound. And that, um, that interface between you know, using conventional instrumentation or using these um, quantum level um, sonification methods uh, is something I'm very fascinated by and I think we can uh, we can uh, you know do this in different ways we can do a literal translation of, of a hierarchical system like a protein or a virus like you mentioned that earlier um, or we can um, just simply use the construction principles we see in nature um, in the way nature builds materials. Um, the wood in the tree or the spider silk or um, all the tissues in our body, the cells, the organs, you know, really are constructed from very similar mechanisms. And, and so that's what the, this piece actually is, is, is trying to accomplish in a sense that we, we utilize, a, I utilize a, a very limited set of, of instrumentation, you know, focus on piano and cello and some other string instruments and, you know, trying to create, um, we call it functional diversity or um, diversity in impressions and emotions and, and storytelling musically um, out of a very limited set of building blocks. Right? And so that is um, really the kind of thing that nature does when we, we think about the creation of silk or um, nerve cells or muscle tissue or organs or insects or wood, tree, plants. You know, all of these materials are made from chemically a very simple, simple building block. Proteins, a lot of times, um, maybe some other molecules, but they're very limited in terms of the diversity of the original building block and the, the really the structure across different scales makes this makes these materials different and distinct and functional. And so that what what we can do musically as well. And 
And there's sort of a, I think, a really interesting um, way I like to explore inspiration from nature in the sense, in a literal sense, of translating actual sequences and ideas I see in a natural design principle, um, but also to to utilize just the construction principles and, and that nature uses. And I think one of the one of the really powerful ones actually is the idea that you have um, structure. Uh, repetition but also variation and and that's something I'm really fascinated by in a sense that you you can go in a in, look at a natural system and it's not perfect actually it's the imperfections that make it interesting and functional and you know in a very similar way in music as well you you have um, if you had a completely amorphous unstructured evolution of sound which we can create um, but it wouldn't it wouldn't resonate um, very much at least with the the, um, the, the Western traditional music that we many of us here, um, but even other cultures you utilize really this idea of repetition. There has to be some reference back. And, and this, this referencing of, of, of points in space and time is, is actually something that we, we see not only in um, you know, an abstract sense, but actually in a very literal sense in the, in the construction principles of nature. And the way um, we can understand, for example, folding of proteins is, is actually by self-referencing of, of structure through what we call contact maps. And, and so these are essentially um, references of, of geometry to design principles of geometry and structures um, that are encoded uh, in this language. And, and music is, is just a really interesting way of coding these structures. And we found ways uh, in, in the piece you mentioned, to I found ways to um, to make these analogies and express them um, musically, and and sort of use these various uh, interplays of of mathematical concepts for construction, um, ideas, inspirations, um, and and all working within the, the realm in this in this particular piece really of of a limited set of, of construction building blocks, which is a limited set of, of, of instruments I have available to to work with, and and that's there's a very interesting constraint that that I've imposed on myself there and and to explore what can we deduce from that. I, I remember when I met you, I was with my son who was like 14 then and later he applied and yeah, and he's now graduated uh, from MIT as you know. Congratulations. That's, Thank that's you. Yeah. Thank you. And he, he, he told me the other day when I was listening to your music and he was listening too and he's like, that's Professor Bueller's music? I'm like, yeah. But I thought when we met him, he was so humble. It seemed that he didn't know much about music. I'm like, that's what he is like. He's very humble. You know, it, it didn't seem that you are, it seemed that you are a student of music, but the level of music that you're making right now, it's incredible. It's, it's just powerful and empowering. I, while we were talking, I took down a note. I, I was thinking that, you know, do you do you have colored hearing, or or do you connect, uh, or did you connect? You know, when I was listening to the the counterpoint through fractured three. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And did you connect with the crow of the rooster with a hidden sense, I which think kind so. of? Yeah. Yeah. You know that that unexplored that led you to an, an, an unexplored path. Yeah, I actually think that that was yeah. I was actually I was thinking about that as we were preparing for this for this interview I I you know I, I had this um, and I didn't talk about this earlier but the you know w one of the things I think it's really interesting in, in music and in, in, in literature as well of course in storytelling or in, in paintings but but I think music to me is, is a really powerful way it's a high very high level of abstraction I mean I I I, I like to think in very abstract terms and so you know the less um, literal references you have to you know, objects and, and things, the easier for me to process the information. So that's why music is such a, it's such a powerful language for me. But yeah, I, when I was working on the, um, the um, piece with the, the, the counterpoint through Fracture, I, I did a sort of an experiment where I, I was, I was trying to, um, you know, express musically the, uh, the, the concept that you, you have a lot of times in, in both, I think, in literature and also in you know, many other forms of art and, and, and science. The idea that you know an infinitesimally small um, piece um, might become infinitesimally important, and so so an example would be, you know, a single note might be really the centerpiece of a musical composition. But if you just hear that note, it doesn't mean anything, or maybe progression of a few notes. Um, they only become meaningful with all the rest of the piece. And so I think one of the really amazing, um, you know, things I've seen in in, in you know, from human creation actually are, are pieces where basically the um, the um, 
the, um, the, the entire story or the entire music is there only to serve that, that, that moment, that singular moment. Um, and I think that's fascinating. So I, I'm always trying to work towards that if I can. And, and a lot of times this emerges, like you were saying, you know, you, 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 it happens as the, the story is being told and the logical evolution of the piece sort of develops. But in, in the case of the, the fracture sonification, I started actually, um, you know, in a way, I, I started in a very um, systematic way by, by utilizing the, the stresses and forces around a singularity called the fracture. And, um, and that's something I've studied for many years in, 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 in my science work. And, and I, and I utilize this to you know, create a counterpoint by, by having multiple movers in a, in a, in a very mathematical sense, um, using Euclidean rhythms to create the note progressions, to the, the, you know, sort of creating voids um, to, to create information. And then I, um, I recorded um, our rooster actually, um, and I sort of played with that. And I, and, I, and, and I, again, this is something that I, I that this emerged in this piece that I, I was fascinated by this because as I was sort of um, thinking, okay, how can I connect that, that rooster um, sound with that very algorithmic mathematical sort of information, right? That the, that this 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 asymptotic stress field solution gives me, um, and you know, it sort of. Put, was put into place as I was playing with that, um, and sort of, uh, you know, jamming with it, and, and you know, exploring ways and how that can be connected. And I and I actually realized that um, there was a point where it sort of clicked in, okay, in the in the piece in, in the composition that that uh, where it became extremely meaningful. And if you were to listen to the crowing of the rooster itself, it you know, it just sounds like a rooster. But I, to me, when I listened to the piece, it really you know, uh, as a climax at that point. Uh, in, in, the, in the piece that, that really um, sort of, to me, you know, brings out the soul of that rooster in, in a way. And it brings it out in, 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 a, in a very meaningful way. But again, it's, it's more than the sum of the parts, if you wish. And it's only a very small part of the, the piece. And that small part of the piece only exists, it only thrives because of all the rest that's there, right? So if it wouldn't be there, it wouldn't mean anything. Um, but the rest is really sort of the, just the, the build up to that, to that moment. And I think that's really fascinating because it's, Something that we we see in you know in many um, phenomena, you know, be it in, at the nano scale or in material science, and I'm sure in many other fields, um, we're really just um, um, the the singularity where something very small becomes extremely important, outsize outsizedly important, and and to express that is is, is I think very powerful. It's one of these uh, to me one of these essential um, you know ground truths of, of nature. As we all um, trying to study nature, I think. To me, uh, you know, one way of studying nature is by you know, solving physical laws and chemical laws. The other one is is using other methods, and and music to me is one other method of creating a microscope to explore the world around us. And you know, as scientists, we um, and you know, scientists, artists, or whatever humans, okay, exploring, trying to understand the world. You know, that that is really at the core of it. And and I think there's a spectrum of things that we want to see. But yeah, I think that you know a lot of times when I um, I'm I'm definitely following the you know the evolution of a of a construction of something uh, you know in a, in a you know I have principles I use to to build up um, um, the the work I do um, musically, but I, I do I also have um, you know a sense of inspiration and there's the variability and there's a, there's a reference system we create. A lot of times I you know when I when uh, when I talk to the science community and maybe uh, you know science art communities one of the things that's really different between um, you know, creating music and creating science is that in science you have physical laws that are unchangeable but in, in, in music of course we create the we, we create our own universe of whatever structure we want to have or lack of structure and and it's fascinating you know as an experiment so I, I work with as you mentioned the beginning of computers and one of the really, really powerful things about computers is that we can create things that don't exist, right? So you can make up a chemical molecule that a computer, but never has been made yet, right, in a lab, but we can explore it theoretically using simulation. And that is what we call a computational experiment, something we can do also with music. We can imagine a, a world, a physical law, a structure that uh, has not been built yet, um, but we can create it and we can create all the references to itself and create a universe in which it sits perfectly um, and maybe we can discover something about the world that actually exists right? so it provides us an opportunity to explore and uh, yeah that, that rooster I think I'm, I'm I'm just really fascinated by that honestly yeah. I, and, <laughs> Me I, too. I, and I kept actually you know I kept um, 
trying to look for answers to this because I, I, I kept imagining, you know, this is sort of a way where you capture the, uh, the consciousness of this, of, this, of this being in a totally different way and it connects with the human brain. You know, in a, in a way, if you listen to the rooster, um, I mean, it doesn't elicit any significant emotion in you. Right. Uh, well, yeah. um, yeah. it's just disturbing, but um, but yeah, when you have that that whole setup, um, it, it you really begin to look inside that inside the soul of that that animal, and I think that that is something very interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking that maybe if you take the rooster to the cognitive sciences department, maybe and make the rooster hear your music, it would be interesting to see what the rooster reacts like. You know, to yeah. that music. You know, yeah. the rooster listening to the story. Yes, exactly. No, I think that's actually a really interesting point. I mean, we we uh, we are trying a little bit something like that with the spiders. We, uh, but yeah, exactly. I mean, you could, um, sort of the um the I I think the the rooster um yeah I don't know what what he would think actually <laughs> listening to himself and listening to the context. But but we're doing this with the spiders. Um, it, are you? Yeah, when the work we're doing with Tomas, we're we're trying Tomas says you know we're trying to um um you know, we have recorded spider um vibrations and we're. Yes. We actually mm -hmm. were trying to you know, feed them back to the spiders to see can we use the vibrational spectrum oh. or, or you know, human created sounds even to affect what the spider materializes through the sound. I think in a you know, way the spider actually is an interesting system because it, it builds the web, right? And it builds it, um, it's affected by what it hears. And not, it's not actual ears, it's more of a you know, thousands of sensors on the, on the legs of the, um, of the insect. But, um, it, it actually constructs, it, it processes the information about the environment in its, in its brain and, and it, it makes decisions on what web to build. Right? So, so it's a real, I think every spider web is sort of a materialization of sound and which is something I'm, I'm very fascinated by, you know, and, and if we were to alter that sound or maybe um, edit the sound that the spider hears or feels, um, you know, what kind of web will be created by that? So that's a very interesting, yeah, very interesting question how, the animals would actually correspond to that. And, and maybe that's a way of communicating with, you know, animals in, in, a, in, a, in different ways. There's a lot to explore for sure. I must show you that while you were talking about spiders, I was pulling this up on my phone and look at this. Um, can you see it? There's a spider web here. I, 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 can't, I can't see it. Can you see it now uh, on my phone? No, I can't see it. I, I, I don't think I see your video actually. Uh, can you see me now? Yes, I can see you now. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, so far you couldn't see my video, no, right? You, you know. No, but I see it now. But I, I can see your phone. If you, you have to hold it up a little bit higher, then I can see it. Yeah, can you see it? A spider web. Oh, right, yeah. Right. That's near the the list, MIT. Okay. You know, it, it kind of sums up the COVID situation right now. Yeah. Nobody walking past. Yeah. And when I was walking there, I thought I'm going to take a picture to show it to you. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, exactly. yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's definitely um, a creation of, of, of silence or not yeah. by the human. Yeah, population. exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm going to go to my next question. Um, we know that you're developing, you know, the uh, artificial intelligence models to design new proteins sometimes by translating them into sound. I guess your goal is to create new biological materials for uh, non-toxic and sustainable applications. Um, so I'm absolutely sure much of it may go over my head, but you make it so simple, maybe it will not. Uh, but for the sake of those who really understand this, and for the sake of my unending curiosity, <laughs> I will ask you, how does artificial intelligence uh, produce silk protein. Yeah, so you know, in a way you can, you know, and, and understand it in, in a way that um, DNA is really the sort of the building plan for proteins, right? Um, and if you um, if you think about DNA as, as sort of a big book, right? And then we, we can try to read it. We don't know how to read it because we don't understand what it means. Um, but DNA actually isn't really what what is the what is the product of, of or the, the essence of the living organisms. What what really is at the core of life are, are these molecules called proteins. So these are actually built from DNA, but these are the actual machineries, if you wish, the the, the actual materials and the workhorses and whatnot that you know do all the, the work in our body, from motor proteins to cells, neurons, um, transporting information and, and and energy and things like this. So when you think about a protein, um, 
it's, it's encoded by DNA, so it has a sort of a language and a basis to it, how it's built. Then the protein has a structure, and, and, and you can see, imagine this actually as sort of um, a collection of, of letters. And we have shown in the work that each of these letters is um, associated with a unique sound, uh, and that's because of the uniqueness of each molecular structure and its vibrational spectrum at that quantum level. And so you can then assign, if you wish, a tone to each of these um, molecular building blocks. And you can also build similar kind of associations for higher level structures. In other words, how the proteins actually assemble. So they're not just strings, they actually are folded strings. And so I was talking earlier about the self-referencing in music where um, essentially the, I think that's a very powerful paradigm and you can hear it in, you know, I, mean, I would say in, 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 in popular music, uh, there's a very high level of repetition, okay? Um, very little variation. In yeah. Music, right, you have a lot more intricacies in how these things are actually played out. But a lot of times you have referencing of a motif. Uh, it might be altered and, and that might actually tell you something about the spacing between them. But, but it is um, a referencing a system. It creates a web. So to me, when I look at a, or listen to music or look at a score, I, I can see a physical structure emerge that reflects sort of what's encoded in that. And that's something we, maybe we met last time, I think in 14, yeah. 2014, yeah, um, August 2014. Yeah, exactly. So um, we, we had talked about, and I might have mentioned some of those ideas, but we hadn't really uh, researched that. But the last couple of years, we've really gotten very deep into that. And we, we now understand how to make these translations, uh, you know, rigorous. And so we can actually um, build um, models in, in the space of sound and vibrations of a protein, let's say. And once we have that, um, you can then um, look at this, this protein, uh, this coding of, of structure and sequence and information um, simply as a, as a data set, right? So, so something that's a pattern, basically. It's a complex pattern, but it's a pattern that can uniquely describe protein. And if you have you can do this for, we can do this for thousands of proteins, hundreds of thousands of proteins, and we can then take that, that, that score that we've created, which is a code for the, the protein structures, and, you know, and try to teach an AI. So that's sort of saying, well, if you listen to protein music um, that's literally translated without any human intervention, you just make the translation, these proteins sound very strange because they follow some, some <laughs> rules, which is actually the kind of the, the, the rules that nature uses to construct these proteins and make them work for certain purposes. And so to, to make the long story short, um, you know, in the work we talked about earlier, I, I, I mix these actually from a, in a creative point of view, you can take inspiration from that and then mix it with the human perception and human history or my own idea of how things might evolve. But if you do that rigorously, um, you know, you basically hear some strange sounds and it's hard mm -hmm. for us to blend out all the things we've heard before, right? So it's really difficult for humans to forget basically anything you've ever heard. Um, and so whatever we create is gonna be, because our brain has all this memory, all this history, it's not gonna be purely protein music, most likely. It might be, but, yeah. So, so what, we, what we have decided to do is to basically use a, a blank sheet and that's, that's the you know, an official brain, an official neural network. And, and so basically that neural, that neural network has never heard any music, any Western or you know, Eastern music or whatever culture, right? It's not heard nothing. And the only thing that neural network has ever heard are the proteins, right? So that is what we've done. And then that neural network can do a couple of things. It can classify um, or it can generate. So we can ask the neural network to make new music that you know, maybe follows a certain path, a certain direction, just like in human composition. We talked about earlier, you have an idea, you evolve it, you might reference that, but these are the rules we use um, in our own idea, in our own technique we have, our own inspiration we have. The neural network can do pretty much similar things. And so then you can design uh, an artificial protein that way. And we've done that. So we've done, you know, that translation into music. And then because we have a one-on-one -on -one mapping between music and structure I talked about earlier, we can take the musical score and make it back into a protein, right? And then we can make that protein in the lab, we can study it. And, and that's, that's, that's sort of the way we, we have done that. And we have used this for you know, a couple of different applications, including you mentioned the silk protein, we've actually um, you know, you applied it to you know, different families of proteins that um, are sort of, I mean, if you imagine the, the kind of like different genres of music, if you wish, different styles, <laughs> um, you know, that gives you different kinds of proteins. And, those rules for what these are is is sort of what the secret is, right? The nature secret in, in, in that language, and and we can we can learn that really through these AI methods very well, um, and yeah, we've played with that quite a bit. Yeah, slightly out of context. While you were speaking, I'm taking notes a little bit. Um, 
UP's growth infection and release in the protein counterpoint sonification is very spiderish to me, you know, to my ears. Yeah. And almost like an Edgar Allan Poe scene that comes alive, you know. Um, specifically, these lines come to mind. Uh, the building textures, almost like the spider web, you know, that I was just showing you the the MIT list, you know, yep. and near the MIT list, like eerie. It's kind of allegorical. That, that's those are the things that come to mind when I hear that piece, you know. Uh, sad, transformative, very rhythmic. Um, could you share a little bit about the piece, like how how rhythm in protein structures translates mm. in your mind, you know? How yeah, do you so, relate with rhythm? No, that's a great question. I mean, you know the. The, the, we didn't talk about rhythm too much actually, but yeah, I think, you know, in a way, when you think about a protein molecule, it, it has all these different levels. So you can look at the single atom, you can look at the you know, groups of atoms, you can look at the, the entire molecule. And then of course, in a, in a, in a you know, filament of spider silk or in a virus, you're gonna have thousand molecules interacting, billions, you're gonna have you know, multiple structures. And so in a way, each scale has a unique um, pattern of vibrations, okay? and. And you know we can map them into different um, into different frequencies, right? And, and as long as we keep the ratios of these frequencies identical, we can we can preserve um, the information, which is what we do in transposition. And that's really at the core of the translational methods we have. And if you go to very low frequencies, um, you begin to actually hear. Of course, the ear begins to pick up what we call rhythm. So what what, what we've done there actually is to add, um, in addition to you know hearing the this. The, the, melody from the sequence of amino acids and the vibration has a higher level, higher frequencies. You can also hear sort of the, the, the motions, the dances of these molecules, which are in this case scaled to a scale we identify as rhythm. And, and that evolves sort of as we go through the piece, as the, 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 the vibrations change along the way. And we, we kind of have this um, the sweep through the entire structure from the beginning to the end of this, of this molecule. And it, it, it is, yeah, it's a very, um, that, that particular one, uh, you know, sounds yeah eerie. It sounds weird. It sounds strange because we're we're actually using not a not a harmonic tuning, um, um, but we're using the original, um, you know, quantum level tuning of the molecules, which to our ears sounds very strange because none of the none of the instruments that humans have made so far, I think, are are, are tuned based on quantum mechanics. Right? They're all tuned based on yeah. Things, <laughs> you know, or the human voice, you know, air, but they are they're kind of follow basically multiples of, of harmonic waves, which is the basis to uh, you know, the music theoretical ideas about composition and harmony and, and also, you know, has been played with, of course. I think it's very interesting. Some, some musical directions have actually deliberately deviated from that, but it's always the reference point in a way. So yeah, so the quantum world is kind of interesting because it actually goes away from this and it, it you know, has an entirely new way of sounding. And, and, I, and I've used actually, not in this particular one, but in some of the spider work, web work I've done, we've used a you know, method called granular synthesis, where we we can actually you know take these these building blocks of sound and rearrange them, and and kind of say, well, if we have these bits and pieces of sounds um, from that weird sounding instrument, the spider web <laughs> molecules, can we can we kind of put them back together in different patterns? And and that's actually what we do in material science all the time. You know, we make a new protein. You're asking about silk. Um, we're gonna take these individual sequence patterns and we're gonna maybe make a protein that's silk and elastin combined, which nature has not invented yet. So musically, we can do that also by, by, by using granular synthesis, something that um, Zenakis actually has worked on a lot. And, and I think this method is extremely interesting when we think about reconfiguring the sounds from the nano world and making them accessible. And, and making them accessible means actually the following. If you listen to this piece, uh, if it's purely in the scaling of amino acids, let's say, or quantum, um, it just sounds strange, but you have no reference point. But if you have a yeah. point, you know, of the conventional tuning and you can begin to see the deviation from that and, and going sort of meandering forth and back, then you have a, a point of reference. Like in a thing in, in literature and storytelling, you have a reference to a known thing and then the the unknown thing is, is actually exposed through that through that distinction. Um, so I think that's something in music, of course, we need that always. Um, and I think that's that's what we have done there. And then the, the, the words actually spoken 
in that particular piece. Yeah. Uh, you know, they actually, there was actually, I did this during the time when um, everyone was shut down and the pandemic, and I did a lot of work on the, on the COVID virus at the time. And, and, I, uh, and, I, and I had to take notes of this and, and I wanted to add them. So I actually did a, um, um, I used a, a speech synthesis method um, in the oh. IBM to create that. And then I, and then I actually used a, a, a it's a vocoder technique to, to basically create. Oh, the vocoder, yeah. Uh -huh. but, but instead of using, um, you know, harmonies to, to which is uh -huh. traditionally um, in the 1980s or so when this came around, I, I used the vibrations of the proteins to, to modulate oh. words. And that's where the sound, it sounds, I mean, it sounds really, I mean, people told me it sounds like a horror movie, but but it is actually, it's actually that. That's, yeah, it has a story. Yes, exactly. Yes, it has. So, so really, the words are are synthetic, but they're they're modulated. They're sort of computer generated, um, but mm. they're, they're they're overlaid. They're modulated by the innate frequency in these, in these molecules. I think that's that was really fascinating to sort of experiment with and see what comes out of that. I mean, there's just a lot of um, really, really, really interesting effects. And I'm like I said, I'm really interested in then comparing that kind of um, product with what we do conventionally in composition much more you know harmonic and, and has a whole different way of telling a story but but i think they're both uh, begin to clash in some ways but they also like to be you know they, they kind of like to be next to each other yeah, because that's how you can hear the, the similarities and the differences between them yeah it, it, it was beautiful i sometimes feel that all of this should go maybe in a separate department in mit and you know maybe like the Ed Gurdon Center or something you know where people could come and see these things so I'll go on to the next question um, I recall when I met you in 2014 and we spoke about spider silk music vibrations and I came back with an intense project which is like mostly storytelling you know which I do <laughs> I, I work through metaphors and create the to create the vibrations that you found in a protein um, my methods were entirely literary because that's what I studied literature. Um, but I wanted to know, I know most of it you already said, uh, how you mani manipulated matter uh, through using exceptional tools of the nano world, uh, use concept of harmonic waves and strewn material science uh, with kind of like the pebbles of visual arts and philosophy, poetry, mathematics. How did you pattern the series of these impressions in the spider silk music? Yeah, no, that's. Like, I know most of it you already said. I said some of things, no, but it's, these are really great points. And I, and, I mean, yeah, appreci appreciate that, you know, you really, you know, got, I think got really the, the, the core of, of what I was trying to do there. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's interesting when you, uh, when you think about these, these sounds as, you know, I, I like to use them as a way to construct something new. Just like I always use the analogy when I give the, the, the talk on this, actually, I, I have an example of a spider eating a fly, right? And then the fly, <laughs> the, the fly turns into the spider web. But how does that happen, right? Well, it happens because the spider eats the fly, breaks down the fly into its building blocks chemically, and it reassembles them. And since I have I've long been really fascinated with granular synthesis as a because of my background as a material scientist, I, I when we when we started working on the spider web and also the other proteins, that, that I thought is such an such a uh, very direct model for what materials biological materials processing is actually all about, right? It's it's taking a sound and breaking it into the building blocks and making something new out of that. And and it's not and what you can make out of that is is I mean, if you go to the extreme and you really only take the harmonics, that's pretty boring, right? Because, <laughs> but, but actually, what is it? What is the interesting part is when you when you have the boundary, and and I think that's like sort of a phase transition when you go from. I, I gave a talk actually last week, and I and I showed the the spectrum of the spider web, and you know I explained you know this is completely, um, it is not tuned like any uh, you know and any any tuning system we know of. But we can shift it to the one that we know of, and that sounds pleasant to the human ear. And I think it's been discovered multiple times in different cultures around in the human evolution. So it's a very um, there's something there that connects with our brain, I guess, in, in some way or form. But and so yeah, so you can you can kind of explore the interface. So when you continuously shift the um, the, the sound and the granular synthesis, when do you begin to experience the sound as pleasant? You know, is, is there a transition? It's gradual. Is there a sudden change? And 
you know, to me, it's, yeah, when you close your eyes and you listen to it, I mean, it's, it's, there's, there's all structures that come up in your mind and, and you begin to see sort of, a, it's a whole new world of, of playing an instrument. So this is really a, a new type of instrument, right? And it's just enormous amounts of degrees of freedom. So we, so I try to limit the degrees you, you actually explore because otherwise the, the spectrum is too big. Um, but yeah, so we've played with that and we're sort of trying to explain how you go from the unknown spider world to the more known um, world of harmonic evolution of a melody. And then, you know, trying to explain that distinction and, and that analogy to what nature does when we process proteins. And, and that then later on actually led to the work on the AI that we did on, on designing proteins. Because we used the same idea of, of sort of taking those, those building blocks and reassembling them in new patterns. But we did it at a much finer detail. And we did it in a rigorous way that allows us to do the mapping in both directions, right? From, music to protein, but also from protein to music in both ways, yeah. Yeah, uh, your piece, again, out of context, um, Fire Dance. Um, it reminds me of, you know, the uh, Louis Fuller's Fire Dance, where the dancer stands directly in front of the light and uh, throws the dress over her arms, uh, holding them high, show, showing her figure like in a spider's web. Um, this technique was called the spider or transparent movement in dance, and and the vibrations and the and the and the dynamism and the fluidity is very choreographic. So though I know it's not part of your spider series, but the sadness, the pathos, the colors, the sounds—it's almost like Louis Fuller's dance. So have you ever thought of having a you know a you know, an accomplished dancer, do your, you know, um, dance to your melodies? Yeah, no, I had, no, I've had never thought of it, actually, because I've never been, been exposed to that. But I, but I did have a lot of, I had a lot of people, uh, and actually groups, ballet groups and, and dancers, reach out to me uh, around the COVID music, actually. So there have been performances in various countries around the world, both professional, um, there's a ballet in South Africa that has done professional performance, but also just people did, did sort of a crowdsourcing of performances in their own houses and then putting them on social media. So they have oh. to, people yeah, pick that up actually. And you know, that, 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 yeah, I think it's interesting for sure. I, I, I have no, um, you know, really have no, not a lot of knowledge about this, but, uh, but I think it's interesting. Yeah. 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 I was talking to Patricia who, who runs the Merce Cunningham dance school the other day. Oh, okay. And I think she would be, one person, you know, maybe you could collaborate with, you know, and and they would find some amazing, you know, because it needs to reach out to common people, you know, and and relate with, you know, to who they can relate with. So it's beautiful. Yeah, I'll go on to the next one. <laughs> um, this is like you shared the other day, the swamp variations. It's remarkable. Um, briefly speaking, you say the the artful and elaborate uh, performance of sounds in this series of five movements makes me think of an essay I had read um, by Roman poet Lucretius, who believed that the perception of sound occurs when sight and smell interact with the inner structures of the ear. I wonder how you engage your musical feelings and how does your mind um, become the engine of creation, as it were, from material science to music and then into landscapes or ecosystems or from different parts of matter to the unifying spirit of existence. How, how do you manage to do that? Like, how does it start and how does it continue? <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. You know, this actually, it's, it's, it's something that I, that, that particular piece I've been working on for, for a long time, actually. And I, and I, and I, you know, went to it from different directions and I, and I, and I really, I really, when, you know, when this, emerged as something that I, I you know, saw as a, as, a, as a combined structure, I began to, so it's an iterative process to me, you know, I, I begin with an idea um, and I try to model something, in this case swamps, I've been interested in because they, they're sort of this interesting thing that is solid and liquid and, and has really big transformations throughout the, the year. Uh, and so then there's this periodicity and there's this sort of, when you look at a swamp in the winter, I mean, we, we have a lot of swamps here in New England and they look like, you know, they're dead basically, right? And then in the spring, you see these, these leaves sprouting. And so, so that, that is something that I've tried to model there. And, and the transformation is really very different if you go to the swamp in the summer or in the fall or in the winter and so on. And, and I think, you know, I, 
I, it, it, it followed initially sort of intuitive um, approaches. And then I, I began to put a lot more mathematical thinking behind the construction of that piece, such as the style of the different pieces, the kind of ideas I wanted to convey, um, you know, like um, the, there's these, um, you know, structures from emergence to evolution, division, spring, and then retreat. And I, and I decided that um, at the end of it, the, the swamp isn't just um, interesting because it's sort of periodically repeating itself every year and through the seasons, but it's particularly important to understand that a swamp actually as any ecosystem or any living system can kind of go one way or the other. It can either you know, survive or it can die and it can become something totally different, right? A swamp can dry out or it could be a, you know, I don't know, some invasive species come in and, and you know, kill it or, right? So there's all these things that can happen. And so the last, uh, you know, movement actually, you know, really tries to, tries to talk about that. And I, and I was really interested in leaving the, um, the answer open in a sense that I didn't, we don't know what it would be, um, but they're both, both outcomes you can imagine. Um, you know, very um, you know, continuous, very fruitful outcome of repetition of, of life or one that actually goes in an entirely different direction. And, and, and I was, you know, playing, um, you know, this, in this case really with, um, so I wanted to express unexpected uh, changes in directions. So I had, um, I, you know, different techniques I used to create it. One was, um, you know, very improvisational techniques to, um, you know, come up with ideas, referencing them, but varying them a lot. And then the other technique I had was to, to use a lot of, um, a lot of cyclic movements um, that have variation, but also have some repetition, small variations thereof. And so the, the structure actually in the, you know, mathematically follows that, 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 that rule book, if you wish, and um, and so the style of the compositions actually follow that 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 transaction, and and it creates this this interesting you know, breaking of symmetry. Right? So that's that's really important, I think, in this that the, the symmetry isn't is broken, right? And so that that makes it interesting. It's it's not a mirror. It's actually a broken mirror, if you wish. And and these cracks in the mirror is actually what makes this what makes this very interesting. And and I and I then came more of a, across a part where I think I. Um, I became very interested in adding um, really a lot of dissonances in some of the areas, and I and I did that to um, to kind of um, there's there's one uh, one piece. It's um, actually the I think it's the third one, division, where I, I really want to express the uh, the vision of, of life and death, and, and and I think the you know pushing the the, the whole components of the notes into a, a point where they're highly dissonant, and then returning to a a very you know powerful. Um, you know, celebration of life. Um, that that contrast, I think, is very interesting. So that happens in that part, and so all each of the five parts you know, movements have sort of a story to tell, and they, they integrate in that in that picture, and they they come together actually also around the the whole concept of a swamp, right, and what it means, and and what kind of um, you know we can learn from um, both the materials perspective, biological, ecological. Um, sustainability, um, you can think about swamps as just um, a, a sort of a, a metaphor for other things, uh, human life, human existence, and, and that's all what's in that in that piece. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost operatic, you know, the four parts, the five parts, you know, if we put them together, it's like an opera, it's ready for an opera. So I'm going to go on to my next question. It's uh, about your piece, Concert, talking about opera concert of silk and amyloid which is constructed entirely from the sounds generated from amino acids the building blocks of proteins um, please share firstly how you came upon this idea yeah. and how you interspersed the rhythmic, rhythmic motifs um, I hear dots and lines as in you know Mondrian's red yellow and uh, red blue and yellow Yes. And I, I hear the emptiness of forms and the forms of emptiness. So please share with us. Yeah, well, that's a your... conversation. Yeah, no, as, as all of your descriptions are really, really, really intriguing. Thank, thank you. Um, so this, this was an experiment. Basically, we had at the time we had, I had, you know, we had, we had a paper that published in my lab on, on the sonification of proteins. We, we created sonification representation of all known proteins to humans, and sort of this huge library of, of, of knowledge that. We can now hear, and that's sort of another thing we can talk about. But it's it's interesting, and so then I I, I thought um, how we can utilize this in a in a compositional way, right? So now if okay. you if you had a, a constraint now um, that mm -hmm. 
all of the sounds you can make are really only the sounds that come from these proteins, right? So you really begin to sort of immerse yourself in that quantum world and and you can't cheat, right? So we can't say, okay, let's create a, you know, a drum sound or rhythmic sounds from some, I don't know, real instrument or a sample or something. Um, but all we have are really just literally the sounds. As so I picked, um, you know, silicon amyloid are two proteins um, and uh, there might be one or two more in there, I forgot exactly what, but there's sort of a limited set of proteins that are in there and they kind of are form this orchestra. So they give their vibrational spectrum to the group and they, they can be played. And so what, what I did there is to say, can we then utilize these vibrational spectra that they bring to the table to, to make music, to compose something that tells a story, right? Following kind of like same principles that I use when I write more traditional, more classical type music, but then actually writing those, following the same ideas, the same principles, but not utilizing, you know, strings, violins, um, horns, or trumpets or whatnot. I mean, you know, I, or piano but utilizing just these weird sounding proteins and and I and I did that and so so the reason why I think your your point about the emptiness is actually really interesting because there's actually there's an emptiness in there and, and I think a lot of people when they listen to it um, they 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 did not pick that up I mean they, they said oh that sounds like uh, somebody wrote in one of the I, some of the one of the magazines wrote about it and they said it's a it's a they said it's a cheap version of something some popular music which i wasn't actually aware of but really yeah no oh my god no but that's okay <laughs> that's okay actually in the beginning i thought wow that's a weird but then i realized so then i thought about it and i and i and actually it's, it's true because that's the emptiness I'm talking about because the you know the if you if you write any other music or you create you you have any any kind of sound available, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and that's not there. The, that's the case is actually in this case, it's not there, right? So the whole point no. of it, and and actually, so in a way, inadvertently, they they discovered exactly what I was trying to say, um, but they didn't really get it in the sense that like you did. You you pointed it out, and and it's actually the whole point of that is to show that you know this isn't like you know writing playing something on a synthesizer or a sampler or with real instruments or manipulating sound. It's it's really. Um, sort of the, the physics of that quantum world is actually what makes all the sounds work and they sound different and yeah and they are empty in a sense that they don't have as much spectrum maybe as as other instruments have because they're designed to, to sound nice to our ears right um, this yeah. one not. I mean, this is really what it, whatever it sounds like and yeah so to totally correct and i think um a really interesting perception and i think these the, the idea of having each of these sounds having um you know color or shape to them i, I I totally get that, and that's what, I, what happens in my mind when I when I work with them. That I, I see different structures emerge, and if you think about the time scale when they they're referencing themselves, um, creating these folded structures again, that sort of provides a, a three-dimensional or four or five-dimensional version of that music, and and that's what you hear. And and I think you know a lot of a lot of people have yeah actually have, I mean a lot of people have been very intrigued by this because that that um, that type of sound is so different from anything we've ever heard and that's what makes it interesting right so so but again to appreciate that you need to also hear the the other you need to hear what sounds more familiar to us right so kind of a i mean i would actually say that if somebody wants to listen to this you know they can listen to the um, more, more conventional instrumentation and then after that you listen to the the weird protein sounds right and then you or not, i wouldn't say weird but the you know those kind of sounds and you really begin to see the difference um, but you can hear because I use the same principles of composition to all of these. Um, I, you know, you can begin to hear it. It's, by the way, it's a lot easier, I think, to work in a world that is um, entirely new. Um, I found it actually because <laughs> right, if you work in a world of, of, you know, conventional classical instruments, um, you're always bound by the. You have to kind of really. F I, I, for I have to try to force myself to just, to just sort of disconnect myself from things I have heard and, and, and what it should sound like because you want to create something that's, you know, new and, and totally different. Brings out, exactly. It's very hard to do. Um, and that's part of the, the challenge, I think. And that's the exciting thing of creating that kind of music. But, but in the protein music, you know, there's no rule book and there's not even a, a history. So, so it's a lot easier to sort of experiment and, and you're not stepping on anyone's toes, basically, right? So if you if you write something that sounds like that composer or this composer, you know, then that's that that could be a problem. And our, our mind works like that because we can begin to go back to that 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 history we have in our brain. So yeah, so this is very interesting, and I, I think that yeah, I, I'm I'm working on that. And, and a lot of the things actually you mentioned earlier, the the uh, the most recent stuff on the COVID on the the, the release piece, that is is made on a based on a similar type of technique actually as this one. 
Yeah, I wouldn't have, I don't think I would have caught on to the the emptiness and the form thing had I not worked with a German sculptor not too uh, long ago. And he, he, he and I were talking about a story uh, which is called, sculptor was called Sunyata, where he was a quantum mechanist. And I think he's friends with you on Facebook, Julian. Oh, and yeah. Uh, yeah, and his work, Sunyata, has that form and you know, the, 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 the dissolution of form into nothingness and nothingness coming to form, you know. And once we relate other works of art with music that you make, I think it will become easier because I think your music needs a little bit of study as, as well. I mean, you don't have to be intensely studying. You know, I don't understand quantum mechanics, but I study a little bit. And it gets easy to relate with that kind of music. Mm -hmm. I think a little bit of study is required. Yeah, but, um, but because, I know it's yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. But, but it does take yeah. You're right. I mean, it takes um, a little bit of effort from the you know perspective. But yeah, that's, that's a good thing. I think that's part of what I um, what I'm what, what I'm trying to do actually is to make people think about different manifestations. And I mean, for the you know for the the art community, it's interesting to learn about science. And for the science community, it's really interesting to learn about art and and how how that's different and similar in some ways to scientific pursuit and. And you kind of have this, um, but it's 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 hard to find, you know, a lot of people that really live in both worlds. And and Cast yeah. MIT is a great place actually. I work yeah very closely on a lot of these these things and many other things. And it's it's a you know wonderful place at MIT to to make these connections and have a group of people that yeah. foster that. And I think it's it's actually not only good for um, you know for us and, and others, but also for the students, you know, to see that. I think it's very interesting, very important for them. Yeah, yeah. Had it not been for you, I wouldn't have stepped into this intersecting world of science and art. So going to my last question, I know time is passing by and you have students at MIT waiting for you. Um, and uh, just behind uh, my home here, there's a queue for the COVID testing going on. Right, okay. And yeah, and uh, so this uncertainty, this crushing of ex ex uh, you know, aspirations that is experienced by some students, um, who cannot return to campus. Um, it's kind of like counterparted by your piece, viral counterpoint of the coronavirus spike protein. It's, it's magical, it's enchanting. Uh, it co contains these deep elements of sadness. And as, it, as is, you know, you're walking past the Charles and you can hear it on the waters. And the, the accompanying faith that everything is going to be fine again. Uh, this piece seems to open the windows to harmony and acceptance in these difficult times. Please share with us how you feel that these, these vibrational patterns, you know, um, could actually be therapeutic and help people mm. feel differently, accept, accept what's going on instead of living in a denial mode. No, that's a great point. I, you know, when I did this, I, this was actually at the beginning when the virus, you know, caused all these shutdowns. And, and I, and I, as you know, we just talked about a lot of different things we've done on, I've done on proteins. And I, and I saw this protein, you know, in the news, basically, you know, people had, had studied it. And I, and I, and as a material scientist, protein scientist and a composer and, and creator of, of music, I, I was intrigued by this because the structure is so beautiful, uh, yet so deadly. Right. And, and, and I, and I began to actually, you know, work on that translation and I, and then you know put it out there and and it, you know had a, had a really big interest and I you know realized you know after talking to a lot of people about it and, and hearing a lot of questions you know one reason why it resonated so well with people and actually helped them um, appreciate something I got a lot of emails and, and messages saying you know this helped me to see something positive in the virus it helped me understand the virus it helped me engage with the virus um, it helped me understand about the science behind it it helped me appreciate the beauty in it even though it's so deadly. So I think all of these things happen because, um, and it's almost like, um, you know, it's, um, it's an often said phrase, you know, music is a global universal language. And it is true though. I mean, it's even though it's probably over, overstated sometimes, but, but in this case, it's actually, it was true because, you know, everyone around the world heard it and they, the ones who understood, you know, how it was made by, 
reflecting the structure of this protein, the folding, um, it was a way of accessing this information. And no matter where you lived, where you came from, what language you spoke, you could, you could hear it. And everyone understood the same thing out of it. And, and so that was one thing that sort of global phenomena. And like we said earlier, it inspired a lot of dance dancers and ballet and, and other people to work with it. Um, and the other thing is, you know, it actually created sort of a, a, a way of engaging with the virus. And I think for me personally, that was one reason why I did that. I, you know, it was a very scary, it, was, it is still a, still a scary time, but back then, you know, in, around February or so in March. Um, yeah. You know, for, I think for people to work with the virus in that way and, and, and studying it and engaging with it, <laughs> you know, it's a very MIT way. You know, you, I know you, you have <laughs> been MIT for a while. You know, we, we really like to sort of put our hands on things and, and, and try to, study it and and you know yeah. work. and for me that was that thing you know I, I i looked at the virus and i and it was a way for me to 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 apply some of the techniques to engage with it instead of being scared of it and i think in the general population that's what it did as well so it created this this idea and then the the beauty of it actually is sort of an interesting thing you know you set out and talking about the the deceit and the um the deadliness of the virus but you know I kept telling people I was, when they interviewed me for this, they said, oh, I'm surprised. It doesn't sound like something from a horror movie or scary, but I said, well, you know, the, the structure is beautiful. It, it's, it's actually a, a very intricate protein. It, it's, it's a protein that has a lot of helices that fold it on top of each other many times. And that creates musically what's, what we call counterpoint because of the, the, the coding of the geometry, which is so intricate. And I, and I have um, actually written a little paper on how we did that and how I, how I did that. And, and you can see the, 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 the mapping actually, uh, how the score was created. And it's just a really intricate um, sort of um, feature. Now, any other protein has that also, but usually at a smaller scale, but this one is just a very big protein and a very complex, but very, very beautiful protein. And, and what I learned from this actually is that, you know, the, of course, and I explained to people, just because the protein is intricate or interesting or beautiful or just scientifically arresting, that doesn't say anything about whether it's good or bad, you know, it's just that it's, it's made to be lethal or infectious, right? And it's a very effective protein. That's what it, you know, has evolved to be. And, and that's what it is. And so we can hear that in the music. Um, and, and it sort of teaches us, you know, that, of course, that's the, the other interpretation of the human mind then to say, well, how does music, how is it supposed to sound like? That's not in that protein, right? The protein might sound beautiful, but it's deadly. Right? And that's yeah. the point about the, the protein language. You know, when we learn how these proteins sound like, they're not literal. I mean, we, we can listen to proteins that are disease proteins and they might sound beautiful. We might listen to a collagen protein, which is one of the most important proteins in our body. And it might sound not very interesting because actually it's very repetitive and there's no variation. So, so that's, that's what we're trying to learn. You know? So what protein sound is actually creating that function or this function and, and how can we alter that? And the other thing that you know, we have actually done, and so, so I think that, that idea of engaging with it, healing in a sense of engaging and seeing the beauty in something so deadly, I, I did not know that actually when, when I did that, but, but clearly has resonated around the world, um, you know, really as a way of just, just seeing something positive in something so deadly um, is, is great. I, I personally think that's a good way of, of living life in general. You, you have to see, you know, the, the positive things and the, 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 the nice patterns or features and, and whatever life throws at you. But, but that was sort of a reflection of this as well. And I think that's a, that's a very positive message, you know, um, that, that a lot of people engaged with. And that was, that was a good outcome, I think, in a sense. Um, and, also, and also provided a lot of people to think about music and, and science and the interface. So it was a good um, kind of way of, of, of outreach to the community, which I am very passionate about, as you know, um, you know, getting people from all sides science and art to, to engage with the crossover between them and to teach that they are much more similar than we think. So, so anyway, so that, that's what we did there. And, and then there's some practical applications in, in a sense that we're, we are trying to work on, on, on using AI methods um, to, to actually come up with molecules that are potentially antibodies. And that at the core of that work actually is um, what, what this, um, this coding as a musical score is, is, is for. Um, you know, in that case, we're not using to listen to it, we're actually having AIs, AIs listen to the, the different, corona, different coronavirus species to come up with ways of trying to find antibodies to bind to the protein. But that, that's I know, uh, yeah, I, I, um, I just have two quick follow-up questions. One being, how do you find time for all of this? Like, you have so much work, you're in so many departments at MIT, you know, how do you find 
time for all of this. I just wonder. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, MIT is a great place to, um, to engage in, yeah, like I said, many different people, many different groups. Um, and, and it's also, um, you know, a place that, that once we, I mean, we all very driven. And I mean, once you kind of set your mind on something, you, I mean, we just, we work very hard and put whatever hours we need to put in the, to solve the problem. So, so I think that's fine. I mean, the other thing is, I mean, we, the, all the music work I do by myself uh, for the most part, um, but the, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the other things, um, I have a large group of students, of course, that are working with me on, on everything. So, um, you know, including the spider webs and, and, and some of the calculations for the vibrations. Um, we have published papers on that. I do most of the artistic type of work on, on music, all of it pretty much. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there are a lot of students that also participate and, and that's an inspiration too, right? So, um, so there's a team behind there, of course, but, but I think, you know, in a way I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, really excited about the, you know, the opportunities MIT gives us all to, to work on these kind of yeah. you know, connections that, that many other places, uh, many other universities maybe wouldn't, wouldn't allow us to easily make, but MIT is this unique place where, um, you know, you can, you can explore and, and, you know, cross disciplinary boundaries and, and it's, it's definitely true. I mean, I've been there for almost, almost 15 years now and, and it's, or actually 15 yeah. years in the summer. Um, and it's definitely true. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know how, how you love MIT. Um, the final question is, you know, when you were talking about this being a therapeutic, you know, uh, tool, um, the coronavirus music, do you think it's helping your kids as well? I know you have young kids. Yeah. Do you think it's helping them to, uh, you know, understand the virus and escape the deadliness and find beauty in it? Yeah, I mean, I... Um... Um, I actually had, yeah, so my, my, my youngest is uh, five turning six. Um, and when she, when I was working on that, on, on the proteins, actually, she kept seeing the, you know, the pictures of proteins on my screen. And, um, and she was always very scared whenever she saw a picture of a protein, you know, that's the coronavirus. Um, but, the, but the older ones, um, the next, the next one's nine. And then uh, my, my, my oldest one is, is 11 turning 12 soon. And, you know, they were much more, they actually are, a lot more interested, of course, in the science, but then everyone, I try to teach them, actually, is I showed them everything I do, and I showed them how, you know, the, the, you know, the, the molecule vibrates, and how that's like a string, they, but they all play piano, so they, they, they do, uh, they play instruments, so I explain to them, I open the piano, actually, and show them this is the string vibrating, and so they, I try to teach them, right, um, yeah. I'm, I'm not, we're not as courageous as you in, in homeschooling, so congratulations, and that, that's a big honor. No. <laughs> yeah. but, but I, you don't I, have the time. <laughs> no, no, but I'm, I'm trying to do what I, what I can in, in teaching them. So, so yeah, definitely, uh, I, I, I share everything I do with them um, and explain to them. They, they go to every webinar I give, you know, and I... And, and what a blessing. Now, with Zoom, you know, and I, and I bring my kids yeah. actually to MIT as much as I can. Um, those in my department know that they, you know, whenever there's a seminar or an event or something, I, I try to I try to bring them there. And I think it's, it's important for them to see it, um, especially the younger ones, um, you know, for them to see, okay, this is how, you know, science is done and you can see it from the inside and, and, um, and, and so they can learn. Yeah, I, 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 use, I use it for that and, and I share that with anyone. I mean, we have a camp every year, um, not this year, but usually in the summer, um, but we have middle school and high school kids come and spend a couple of weeks at MIT with a teacher I work with. Um, and, and yeah, so we, we opened the MIT up and I think that's one of the greatest things is sharing. I, I think in, in, you know, sharing that, the passion, the ideas, um, and especially with the new generation, I think that's really, I mean, as you know, I, the, the, the students, the undergrad students have no, no bias on previous knowledge. They, they come in the lab and you tell them, hey, can you make that new protein? And they say, sure. And they come up with the most, <laughs> because you know, all of us, we have done this for so many years and we have, we're biased, you know, this is the solution we might want to have, or maybe this doesn't work. And that's so refreshing actually working with students, but also with kids. They just, and, you know, and you ask about my own kids and my own kids ask questions that, are just really amazing, you know. They uh, and that's that's actually sort of a, a, um, a question that comes from a human nature, an unassuming place that knows very very little about science. And these are the best questions, you know. So I appreciate that. Yeah. And so, do you have a program like that that is for kids, especially uh, yeah. where you? Yeah, you do have a program. Yeah, we have that. I mean, we, like I said, we didn't do it this year. But we have a program start with a middle school teacher, and it's it's a it's a small program with. 
I think ten, between 10 and 20 kids. I think last year we had something like 20 kids um, and they spent a couple of weeks with a teacher at MIT. Um, then we also have, I, we have a camp that we did every year for one day for kids from oh, all the families you know, and the staff and the faculty and students of, of my department to, to come and spend the day at MIT in, in the labs. And yeah, I think that's really the, the funnest part actually um, is to give them some insight and, and an opportunity and just to see it, you know, they're going to find their own path. I mean, they should, they always going to find whatever they're going to do, but at least we can maybe inspire them and, or at least, you know, yes. give them some information piece. Right. So that's, that's how I feel. And I, yeah, it's, it's, it's really awesome. And MIT is a great place for this, of course, as well. Yeah. The last message is so important for all homeschooling parents, you know, who are scared of homeschooling or parents who are not going to homeschool long-term, but even for a short term, you know, not yeah. to be scared of sharing any kind of information with their kids, which is inspiring for them. Yeah. So um, I'm going to let you go on that note and uh, let silence have the last word. Thank you. And uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to meeting you someday because yes. I have to give you the book I wrote and, um, and that has a chapter on you. So I need to meet so you someday <laughs> once, yeah. once the COVID situation gets better. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Take care. I'll see you. Yeah. Thank you.